So many people are looking to live happier, more stress-free lives. We provide interviews from mental health experts across various fields because we know finding quality information isn't always easy. Let's find more sanity together. On today's episode, Dr. Jonathan Greeson talks about OCD, the role of uncertainty in OCD, and his approach to treatment. Dr. Greeson is a clinical psychologist, director of the Grayson Center, and adjunct clinical assistant professor of psychiatry and the behavioral sciences at the University of Southern California. He has specialized in the treatment of OCD for more than 40 years and is a nationally recognized expert. He's the author of Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder, which he was awarded for by the Association of Behavioral and Cognitive Therapies. Additionally, he has been awarded the Patty Perkins Lifetime Achievement Award from the International OCD Foundation. He has been featured in People Magazine, The Oprah Winfrey Show, and Nightline. He serves on both the Scientific Advisory Board and the Speakers Bureau of the International OCD Foundation. Now on to the interview. All right, John, thanks so much for coming on the show. I appreciate you taking the time. It's a pleasure. Um, so, you know, as, as the, the topic suggests from the name of the podcast, we're going to be talking about OCD today. But before we get into OCD, a question I've been asking everybody is, what is your approach to treatment? What does treatment mean to you? So, you know, I think the core label is that I'm a cognitive behavior therapist. I'm actually a fairly eclectic cognitive behavioral therapist, so I don't... Uh, I think it guides my understanding of human behavior and what I do, uh, but I think a lot of things can be included under that that aren't formal cognitive behavior therapy, so I feel comfortable pulling from wherever I need to. Mm. And um, wh- when it comes to CBT, some people are more big, bigger C, meaning more on the cognitive side of, of the field, and some people more big B or more on the behavioral side of the field. Do you find yourself falling on on either side of that? I'm so old that I existed before there was CBT. It mm-hmm. was cognitive therapy and behavior therapy before they joined. Uh, so I like to think that I'm actually a mix of both of them, uh, which I think is technically a better way to be going. Okay. And, and so what does that, what does that mean being a mix of both? Uh, I mean, I hate to be, um, not humble, but it means I have an understanding, a pretty good understanding of behavioral principles and of cognitive therapy principles and how the two intersect as opposed to being rigidly in one camp or the other, you know, in the behavioral camp where I don't think people think or in the cognitive camp where I think I can get everybody just to change their thoughts by telling them to. Okay. So you see it as a merger of both as being, being the most effective way to help people change. As if it were really CBT. Okay, great. Yeah. Um, so before we jump into OCD treatment, um, people, everybody is pretty much heard of OCD, but people might not fully understand what OCD is. So I was hoping that you could um, explain what OCD is um, in, in more detail for people. This is the part where we spend three hours? Yep, m- maybe even 10. Yeah. So, <laughs> you know, let, let, let me just give the core three definitions uh, you know, we have obsessions and compulsions, okay? Mm-hmm. Obsessions, what is the person afraid of? And it's limited by human imagination. So I can be afraid of contamination. I can be afraid that this injury is going to happen. It's like, what is, what is it that scares me? There are the compulsions. What do I do to try to fix it? Those two things are not enough to help me understand the symptom. They're also the feared consequences. So let me just give an example. Let's say I have contamination, okay? So saying that it's contamination, I still don't know what the person's scared of. They might be scared of, or they could be scared of dirt, let's say, or, you know, a virus for the heck of it, because that's popular right now. But are they scared of getting the virus? Are they scared of spreading the virus? Or are they just scared it's going to feel icky? Each of those is a different feared consequence. Each of those is going to guide my treatment in a different direction. Knowing that they have contamination doesn't tell me that they're going to wash their hands. They might have some magic ritual in their head where I just think about soap. You know, so again, human imagination is the limit of what symptoms can be and what the focus is. 
So we know, or you guys will know shortly, there are a million presentations of OCD. And the question is like, what makes it OCD versus something else? And at the core of all OCD symptoms, the person is trying to be 100% certain. Okay. Not probable, not low probably, 100% absolutely certain. So they're constantly guided by what if. So frequently they know that something's a low probability, but they would like there to be no probability. And the problem is that research has shown us that the only people who are 100% certain are stupid, which most OCD suffers above average intelligence, so I can't really help them learn to become certain. What I can do is help them learn to live with uncertainty forever. That mm -hmm. they can do. And um, I know seeing you talk at other presentations, you also often talk about um, the people that you treat are better with uncertainty after treatment than what the what the rest of the population's uncertainty right. tolerance when might we be. We tell people, and, and we're not kidding when we say this, that if you recover from OCD, you won't be normal. You will be better than normal. And the whole COVID-19 crisis has actually demonstrated that because I and a lot of my colleagues have seen that our patients who have done well in treatment they were handling this way better than their families. Their families were doing all these things, them close of like, my family's crazy than me, I don't get it. Uh, one of our clients who had had contamination issues at a support group meeting, he said, I'm watching all these so-called normals and all the things they're doing, which actually don't make sense. I feel like I should hire myself out to tell them how to protect their rituals. And, so, you know, yes. one of the goals of CBT is to become your own therapist. So it's amazing that, that your patient knew it so well that they said, huh, maybe I should be helping other people with this. Well, yeah, he was going to help them get worse. You know, it's like your, your rituals aren't really, you know, you're not really doing your, your cleaning rituals right. I can help you do it better. Mm -hmm. Okay. So the obsessions are the fear. Um, the compulsions are used uh, to neutralize the fear. And you had talked about... Um, behavioral compulsions, which people are familiar with, like washing your hands. Um, can, can you compare that to maybe some more like that, like cognitive compulsions that people might not think about? Well, cognitive obsessions as well as compulsions. Mm -hmm. um, you know, saying that the focus of OCD is uncertainty, you know, clients have three traits that we're not going to be able to get rid of. Uh, this will get to your question. Mm -hmm. um, the first trait I already mentioned, they're above average intelligence. The second trait, they may not realize it, they're very creative people. The core of creativity is two words, what if. And once you tell that to somebody with OCD, it's like, all right, if that's, the, if that, if that's creativity, yeah, I'm creative. Now, I say what, you know, I say creativity, people think art and all this great stuff. That's not what creativity is for. Creativity is survival. Okay, it's where's the tiger? How can I make sure it doesn't eat me? Where's the tiger? How can I make sure I eat it? In the modern world, survival is also mental. You know, it's what's a threat to me as my being. So if it's really important to me to be a good person, then I'm going to start to look why, in what ways might I not be a good person? Like generally, or to put it more clearly, generally you don't look at for terrorists when you leave your house. Mm -hmm. You're not worried about. But if you hear that there are terrorists in your neighborhood, suddenly when you open that door, you're going to go like, where do I look? You're going to try to think of all the places they could be. So people with OCD are thinking of all the possible ways that a disaster could happen. And again, probability doesn't matter. You know? And again, if you talk to a parent, you know, would you like to put your kid at risk for having cancer? You know, and it's like, I want to be absolutely sure that doesn't happen. Unfortunately, we can't actually do that, but none of us really want to live with, you know, low probabilities but we're all trapped by it. So some other possibilities, um, you know, I could have the thought occur to me, you know, I could kill my wife and then I think like, but I don't want to kill my wife. Why do I think about killing my wife? Now, a person without OCD would just go like, huh, that's a weird thought. If I OCD, it's like, why am I thinking that? And as soon as I want to know why am I thinking that, that's the end. I think because I actually want to kill my wife, even though I don't think I want to kill my wife. Maybe do I have some secret hidden desire that I'm not aware of, you know, and, or maybe I don't really want to kill her. Maybe I don't really love her, but I mean, I really feel like I love her, but how do I know if I love her? Like, do I really feel like right now that I love her? I mean, I think I love her. I mean, I do love her, but how do I know that I love her? You know, and, or, or what if I am going to kill her? How do I make sure that I don't kill her today? You know, or, you know, I, it might not be that I really want to kill her. Maybe I'm just a really evil person, but I don't want to be an evil person, but maybe I am evil because like, 
that's crazy. Who would want to think about killing their wife? So anything that I can be so so some there some other themes of OCD. One is having violent thoughts, you know, and again, people think like that's a terrible, strange thought, really, like it popped in your head to kill your wife. Like that's weird. That's not weird. Mm -hmm. It's normal. It is normal to hold a new baby and think about killing it. Now, people, you say that to people and are like, no, sorry, I don't do that. But, you know, what do you say when you hold a new baby? Oh, it's so cute and little and helpless. And in the back of your mind, it's like, its life is in my hands. Again, so many people that thought it was so quick, it's like they don't even know they had it. Other people are aware and they don't really care about it. And the reason I say violent thoughts are normal, because right now people are still listening, maybe going like, no, nah, not normal. But think about certain TV shows. Uh, and this is a little bit getting dated now, but the TV show True Blood. Mm -hmm. okay, True Blood, there are good vampires, bad vampires. And in the show, the heroine, you know, is in love with a good vampire. And in every show, they have to have explicit sex because it's HBO. And every time they have sex, part of their sex is he chomps down on her neck and blood's pouring out. But in this show, that's a good thing. And the show's real popular with a ton of people, right? It was, you know, and it's like, really? How much weirder are your violent thoughts? Mm -hmm. Other ones are, how do I know I'm not being a pedophile? Yes. How do I know I'm straight? How do I know I'm gay? Uh, have I offended God? Uh, when I'm driving, how do I know I haven't accidentally run somebody over and I didn't realize it? So I need to go around the block to make sure I didn't hit somebody, but on my way around the block, it feels like maybe I'm hitting more people, so it takes a really long time to get home. Then I get home, and I have to check my car, look at every dent to see if it's a new dent or an old dent. Because if it's an old dent, maybe then I didn't hit somebody. If it's a new dent, now I have to worry that I hit somebody. But, you know, even if it's an old dent, how do I know I didn't hit somebody in the same place so that old dent really is evidence? And I can go in my house and I try to retrace my entire trip just to try to see that I did hit somebody. And if I watch the news and hear about a hit and run, even if I was 10 miles from it, I'd have to convince myself I wasn't there. I can worry again, do I love the person I'm with? Uh, you know, we have body dysmorphic disorder, which is, you know, a form of OCD, you know, where I feel like I'm incredibly ugly or some part of my face is really ugly. Health anxiety, you know, which, you know, I, I can think that maybe I'm sick in some way. And, and health anxiety, just as an aside, people always think like it's a matter of you're a hypochondriac, you're not really sick. This is not true. You can actually be sick and be a hypochondriac, you know, but there are plenty of diseases that you can go to the doctor. They can't tell you what it is. They can't make it go away. And you're stuck living like that. For my hypochondriac, I spend all my time thinking that and I'm in fear of it. I don't mm -hmm. really have something, but it doesn't have to be in my mind all the time. I, I feel like I've given you a brief uh, description yeah. of a bunch of forms of OCD. A bunch of different, uh, and then I, you know, more, and more of the traditional was like checking, checking stoves to make sure that, you know, that the house doesn't go fire, checking that 20 times or checking the windows, making right. sure there's locked, um, worried about getting, being robbed or losing security, like people stealing your data off your phone while you're walking around connected to Wi-Fi, mm -hmm. or people getting your house and stealing your documents, um, weather events, pestilence, like bugs, bed bugs, uh, yeah, and, and the list goes on. So Rabies. OCD, you know. rabies. Yep. So OCD Again, is not as it small. Is limited, it is limited by human imagination. Mm -hmm. Anything you can say, what if I don't want that to happen, can be the focus of a person's problem. Mm -hmm. And what's the difference between a general worry and an OCD worry? You know, sometimes people will come to me and say they've been, they had previously been diagnosed with generalized anxiety disorder. My personal opinion, so we're, we're leaving, you know, uh, that, you know, potentially accepted data. I think of general anxiety disorder as OCD light. Mm -hmm. right? Because again, worry, what do I want? I want to know for sure. But in general, as anxiety disorder, the things I tend to worry about seem normal to other people. I'm worried about my job. I'm worried about that. I insult people. You know, I'm, I'm worried about those things as opposed to did I get AIDS from a doorknob? You know, so I think this kind of a continuum of presentations that go from this seems kind of normal this is weird oh my gosh that makes no sense at all you know how is your how is your mother having touched something and it contaminate you by mother what does mother contamination mean so i i, I think and you know th i think the you know so a general worry you know if i'm worried that it's ocd 
it already makes me suspect that it is. Because I'm spending a lot of time worrying and it's interfering with my life, you know. So the issue is, you know, what is the severity of it? Mm -hmm. And one thing that you had mentioned when we, when you mentioned, when we had talked uh, earlier was one, one question to ask is how much time are you spending thinking about this? Like if you're worried about a headache or, or a lump or anything, how much time in your day are you spending thinking about it? Uh, Yeah. You know, I mean, you know, if I have a lump on my arm and I'm worried it's cancer. Mm -hmm. Okay. You know, that sucks. I'm going to worry about it. I'm going to go to a doctor. But why would I be checking it every 20 minutes, right? The lump's there. It's not changing in 20 minutes, but I keep checking it, you know, as if like something magic is going to happen in the next 20 minutes, it's going to go away. If I have BDD and I think my nose is ugly, there's really no need to check the mirror technically. All right, nose is ugly. (laughs) No, I got to keep looking. Does it look right? How's it, you know I mean? Going over and over. You know, and plus, of course, I'm going to add a lot of other disasters to that. You know, there are going to be consequences that, you know, the way my nose looks that are going to interfere with my life. Mm-hmm. And um, doing these behaviors of trying to find the certainty um, is a source to make the OCD grow. Uh, you know, so segueing into the treatment. So, like, what is the treatment for this and what what are people doing to make the OCD worse for them? Okay, so... Well, you know, let me let me answer this question and let me, if it's okay with you, compress 40 years of research into three minutes. Absolutely. Okay. So the treatment of choice for OCD is a cognitive behavioral technique called exposure and response prevention. This goes back to a little bit before 1979. Okay. But if we want to let people read the research, let's say we know this is a fact by 1985. In in the 90s, the American Psychiatric Association and their treatment guidelines for OCD conclude that ERP, exposure response prevention, is the first line treatment for OCD. Um, The American Psychological Association and their their ideas of what is the ideal treatment for OCD, again, exposure and response prevention. International OC Foundation will tell you ERP is the treatment of choice. There are virtually no experts who disagree. And in the field of psychology, psychiatry, mental health, this is unbelievable. And yet, it is incredibly hard for people to find treatment. From onset of symptoms, it generally is 14 to 17 years for people to find proper treatment. So it's kind of weird to imagine we have a treatment that works, that every expert, every professional organization is saying, do this treatment. And so we found that it's easier to treat people with OCD than it is to change the behavior of mental health professionals. Exposure response prevention has two parts, more than that really. Uh, And although the form of it comes out in 1985 and we do basically do the same way, but you know, things we've learned over the years have been incorporated into it. So ACT has incorporated it, you know, obviously other cognitive techniques are, but the core is exposure response prevention. We're going to have somebody confront the things they're scared of, actually do the scary things to risk having their worst things happen, which sounds terrifying, of course. And we're going to ask them to not do their rituals, to not try to get rid of it in any way. So on the surface of it, if I'm talking about an OC problem that you don't have, it doesn't sound so bad. Right. You know, I'm telling you, OK, you know, we're going to have you touch this, of course, before the pandemic. But you know, we're going to have you touch doorknobs. I'm going to have you touch toilet seats. I'm going to have you touch all these things and not wash your hands. I'm going to have you contaminate your entire environment. So you're going to risk getting sick. And the purpose of this is not to prove that you're safe. You can get sick. I can't say that you won't. It could be a low probability that, but it could happen. So I can never tell you that your house won't burn down. I can't say you won't get sick. You know, are you actually living in matrix world and everything is made up? I think this is the real world, but I actually can't prove it. So Uh I just pretend it's the real world. And if I wake up in that other place, you know, that's when I'll deal with it. So we're never saying that things are certain. We're never trying to prove it. The goal of treatment is to help you learn to live with uncertainty. 
Now we know clients can do this. I will ask people, you know, you know, is there somebody who you love who's not in the room with us right now? Who they'll tell me and say, are they alive right now? Yeah. How do you know? Yeah, how do you well, know? I know. I just saw them. Okay. Sorry. They could have dropped dead. And then that points out a very important thing. You feel certain they're alive, but you actually don't know. So you're going to pretend that that feeling is true and you're not going to deal with it until you go in the other room. And if they're dead, then you're going to freak out. So even though we can demonstrate you don't know it, I can't make you feel uncertain. In the same way, if you feel uncertain, logic is not going to make you feel certain. Logic does not change feelings. Mm -hmm. You know, people that people have a hard time wrapping their heads around that, but it doesn't change feelings. And the psych one experiment, I put a shock electrode on your hand, ring a bell and shock you. And I keep doing that until you start jumping when I shock you. I take the electrode off. Logic says shock's not happening. I shock you. I ring that bell. Your body jumps. Same with all emotion. So if I want my emotions to stop because of logic, it's not happening. Logic doesn't change feelings. It gives me a reason to go against them. I'm going to keep suffering if I don't confront this. So I'm going to suffer by confronting it. So eventually I can get better. I have to live with uncertainty. We had a client come to us and uh, her fear was that maybe she could kill people with, with her thoughts. And she had a great reason for thinking about this. She heard on the news about a study being done in which people in hospitals being prayed for got better than people you know, versus people who weren't prayed for. Poorly done study, really questionable results, but you know, of course the news doesn't report that. So she correctly concluded, if I can save people with the right kind of thoughts, I can probably kill people with the wrong kind of thoughts. You know, did she think for sure she could? She didn't think for sure she could. She it was possible. So she spent 24 seven trying to not have any killing thoughts or to try to undo them. She came to me and I said to her, well, maybe you can kill people with your thoughts, but we know you have a low hit rate. Now, a cognitive therapist who is more cognitive would have said, oh, no, of course, you can't kill people with their thoughts. We're going to do some behavioral experiments to prove that that can happen. I would never do a behavioral experiment. So I said to her, you know, in our treatment, we're going to have you work on killing people with your thoughts. And we are not doing this to prove you can. We're doing this because you were driving yourself crazy trying not to have these thoughts. So it might happen in the course of treatment that someone might die. And we agreed that, you know, it had to be pretty close to treatment. It couldn't be like a year later, you know, you know, it had to be the person they were thinking about. And if they die, you don't get to know if you killed them or not. And I'd like you to stay in treatment. Now, let's say you stay in treatment and you knock off the second person. Really unlucky. I'd like you to stay in treatment. Let's say you knock off a third person. And it's got to be three separate occasions. You knock off a busload. That's still just one. So you knock off through a third occasion, you knock someone off. Okay, we're going to talk about trying to control your thoughts. We'll call the CIA. They'll probably have some use for you. Anyway, so first week of treatment, we worked on killing her dad. And at the end of the week, he died. Oh, wow. He was he he had been sick, but there was nothing. There was no there was no concern about the illness he had that he would die. So did she kill him? I mean, logic assumes no, but there's no there's no way to be be certain. I'm not sure we say logic assumes no. Uh, I'm not sure what the logic would be to prove that no. You're, you're saying, well, I don't know how that would work, so I'm going to say no. And I agree. I don't feel like she killed her. I could be wrong. This could be the one time in history where somebody did that. I don't think so, but I don't actually know. Anyway, she stayed in treatment and got better. If I had been that therapist saying, we're going to do a behavioral experiment and prove you can't kill anybody. What do I say then? Oh, that one doesn't count. We live with uncertainty. And just to define behavioral experiment, a behavioral experiment, it, it sounds exactly what it is, where if you hold the belief, you as a therapist would assign somebody to try and do a behavior and see what the outcome is. And you do that multiple times, just like a research study to try and get an answer on whether your belief or concern was correct or not. Yeah. And, you know, it's great that you just said some said what you did, because you actually reinforced the concept of uncertainty by what you said. Mm. And, and, and what do you mean by that? You said, let's do a research study. Mm -hmm. And as you know, research never proves anything. 
because we use statistics. And what we call proof is this event seems so unlikely. You know, it has to be it has to be less likely than a one in 20 chance. We're going to say that we believe that it's never that we proved it. Always. We're just saying the probabilities are in favor of this not happening. So we could say low probability than always. Research never actually says this can't happen. You know, um, and again, so, you know, sometimes people with OCD or sometimes a therapist is not doing a good job. We'll try to convince them. Don't worry about it because it's a low probability. That becomes a ritual for the per person because they try to in their head, even though they're saying low probability, they're trying to make low probability into no probability. Mm -hmm. That's not going to happen. And what's the problem with someone with with OCD or other types of anxieties actually doing these things that you're saying they shouldn't do? Oh, if I want to be safe by becoming certain. For every logical answer, there's another what if. In a more crude way, if I'm afraid of cats and you have a cat at your house and it's like, hey, lock it up when I come over. You know, you're a cat owner. You don't take me seriously. So every now and then the cat gets out and gets scared. It's like, you know what? I'm not coming to your house anymore. Like we can be friends. We'll meet outside, but I'm not coming to your house. You know? When I used to go out walking, you know, there's these people like three blocks from here. They always let their cats out. Like, I, I, why do people do that? That's crazy. You know, so I would cross the street. And I realized I don't have to walk down that block. I can go a different way. And pretty soon my world has gotten smaller. I used to be able to tolerate being in your house with a cat in the next room. Now I'm having trouble walking out the front door. Mm -hmm. So because for every logical answer there's not a what if i will gradually make my world smaller and smaller and when we talk about ocd you know we talk about people doing rituals how am i going to try to fix this how am i going to try to make it certain you know but whatever i do i can find a way that i did it wrong i wash my hands maybe i didn't do it well enough so i should wash it three times you know i need to actually know that i'm washing so i got to concentrate properly maybe i didn't concentrate properly you know well, how am i going to turn off the faucets you know and oh what about that towel how am i going to dry my hands should i just air dry them and slow you know what? And it's such an ordeal to wash my hands. How do I make sure I don't get dirty in the first place? So we have what we call passive avoidance. What things do I avoid? And I always feel like passive should be in quotes because that's how I give up life. I'm not mm -hmm. going to go here anymore because that's scary. I'm not going to go there until I get to a point where maybe I can't leave the house or there's just so many things that I can no longer feel capable of doing. Mm -hmm. So the trouble is that if I use rituals to avoid if i use just simply avoidance to avoid my problem will grow and get bigger i used to be you know scared at a 50 level on 100 point scale being in your house with a cat now i'm 50 when i open the front door mm -hmm. so the the avoidance um helps the anxiety grow and get bigger and make you, the need for you to avoid get sure. larger yeah. and part you know, of that if, avoidance if i need to be 10 feet away you know and it's like hey you know what 15 feet is better than 10. But then if I start making that my standard, 15 will now feel like 10 and I need to do 20 to feel even better. Mm, and then avoidance could also be more in your head where you're trying to figure out every single, say, I call them webs, where, you know, what's, and you'll see it with coronavirus. Well, how do I know if I got sick? Well, I know the probability of this, but then, but if the person at the supermarket had the mask on, the mask on decreases this, but what about the person behind me, but this person? So you start asking all these different questions and research, maybe Google searching, trying to find all the information in order to get that certainty that everything is okay. Right, right. And of course, it doesn't exist. You know, how mm -hmm. do I, how can I prove to myself that I don't want to kill my wife? Yeah, you know, well, I don't feel like I want to do that. Well, but how, what if it's an unconscious thought? Well, I, then I don't know it. But how do you know that it's not there? Well, I can't prove it. Well, what if it is there? Mm -hmm. You know, and if this becomes my certain, what if it is there? Now, how do I, now I have to try to figure out how it's not. And I have to, and by trying to prove it's not, because basically, you know, somebody would like wonders again, what is an OCD thought? Mm -hmm. so so there the treatment no, I, let me, yeah there is no such thing no, by content there's no such thing as an ocd thought no, do i want am not am i worried about killing somebody no any thought is ocd if i do one of two things if i want to know what it means or if i don't want to have the thought i do either of those that's it so i say i can't get that picture out of my head that will be my obsession we might call that neutral because the only the consequence is just I don't want it in my head, but because I don't want it there, it feels like life is terrible because that's all I can think about. Mm -hmm. 
I'm sorry, I interrupted. Oh, no, 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 that, that, that's fine. Um, so the idea is that the more we avoid, the worse it gets. So if we approach it, or aka exposed to it, it, it should, it should. And I mean, the research shows it has the opposite effect that the more that you approach it, the more your world opens up and the fear decreases. If I have the right goal. And, okay. And what's that goal? So another story, uh, therapist brought a client to me, uh, cause they're having trouble with them. His OCD was, he didn't like the idea that he or his family could die at any time. And she had been seemingly doing the correct exposures. They were having, imagine the family dying and how he'd go bitter him dying. He wasn't getting better. So they run into me and I said to him, um, well, do you accept the goal of treatment? I'm a little bit of a pain in the neck. So, you know, he was trying to guess what it was. So I said like, all right, what's the goal of treatment? And I said, well, the goal of treatment is for you to learn to be happy in a world where you or your family can die at any time. I don't want that. All right. Tell me the alternative. And it was really good. He laughed because right? there is no other world. I said, this is great. Now we know why you weren't getting better. Because although you were doing the correct treatment, you had some other goal in mind. So the good news is it's not like you have this really nasty form of OCD that's intractable and can't be treated. Or there's some other defect you have and you're untreatable. You simply had the wrong treatment. And then he did something really sad. He refused to make that his treatment goal. He's admitted that no other world exists, but he didn't want to take that goal. So he stayed sick. Hmm. So it, did he stay in treatment or did he? Well, uh, he was with that therapist. I don't know what they did afterwards. Oh, but, okay. But um, as long as that was going to be the problem, I actually won't start exposure of a person if, if I'm not convinced this is the person's goal. I will spend the time working on them to get them to accept this goal. Um, I always tell people that you should not do anything that I tell you to do unless I have convinced you. So I'd rather have you argue with me as opposed to be a good little soldier. Yeah. Um, and I think accept, deciding to learn to accept, you can't just accept it. That would be cool. I could cure people in one session. Learning to accept it means the worst things might happen. I'm willing to take that risk. And how will I try to cope positively with them, no matter what they are? And why would I take this risk? There are a couple of reasons. First of all, how's life been trying not to take the risk? All right, that's not really working. Secondly, you tell me your rituals, I'll show you you're the flaws in them. So basically, however much you're ritualizing, you're not doing enough. Basically, we can establish you need to either behave crazier or give up. Mm -hmm. And the last is you don't have a choice. Anything can happen. You don't want cancer. I mean, sorry, the world doesn't care if you don't want cancer. You don't want your parents to die suddenly. You don't want to get sick. Some things might be lower probability. But again, no probability. You're not reaching there. So you don't really have a choice. Mm -hmm. That's why I would take this risk. Well, th this example of, of cancer, um, you know, wh where do you draw the line of it being a reasonable uh, de decrease in the probability versus unreasonable? So for example, if you're worried about cancer, so you decide that you're going to wear sunscreen or avoid sunbathing or getting too much sun, or I'm not going to smoke cigarettes to prevent lung cancer and, you know, all these, all these different, different things. Where does it become reasonable versus coming into more of a compulsion? What if I won't go out in the sun at all? Is that reasonable? Mm -hmm. That'll prevent me from getting, you know, skin cancer. Mm -hmm. how, how do you get, how, how, do you get how people? much time does it take up? Oh, okay. You know, how, how much of my mental time does it take up? Mm -hmm. You know, um, I, you know, if we're talking about not smoking, you know, I think, you know, generally we agree good idea to not smoke. However, you know what? If you have a cigarette, you're not getting cancer from one cigarette. You know, even if we look at the rate at which cigarette smoking increases cancer, the odds are still against you getting cancer. You know, so I don't know what the odds of cancer are. I'm just going to make these figures up. But let's say it's one in 100,000. Might be worse, might be better. And smoking, let's say smoking increases that, you know, a hundred times. Okay. My odds are still a one in a thousand after that. So yes, that's a hundred fold increase, but it's still one in a thousand. 
So how much do I have to treat cigarettes as absolute poison? Or yes, you know, I don't want to keep smoking them on a daily basis. You know? mm-hmm. And anybody who's telling me that they want to do, you know, they'll give me their rituals or their ways of avoiding cancer. Are they doing it 100%? Do they only eat organic foods with no additives? You know, are they aware of every item in the house and every chemical they use? You know, and unless you live in Montana, what are you doing about the air you breathe? You know, and, um, you know, the bottom line is you can find some people doing all these things. And is there a significant reduction of their probability of getting cancer that makes it worth it at that level? Okay. You know, so the person living on, you know, living in Montana, doing everything perfectly right on their homegrown organic stuff, no meat, blah 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 blah. Uh, are they necessarily not going to get cancer and live longer than me? Definitely, maybe. Hmm. So, if somebody were to come to treatment with you and do exposure and response prevention, what would that look like? So, can we start off? What is exposure versus response prevention, and then what would a treatment course actually look like? We always use contamination just because it's easiest to imagine. Mm-hmm. You know, it's just kind of concrete. So, exposure, we're going to touch dirty things. You know, and the goal is that you are planning to live in dirty world forever. So we're not like, oh, we're doing this. And, you know, somebody said, you know, and we're going to initially say no hand washing. This coronavirus has been really terrible for me. One of the scariest things for patients and, you know, sufferers who know me is hearing that I'm now washing my hands. Hmm. Because I can say from, you know, up until this year, literally never washed my hands unless they were visibly dirty. You know, I'm working on the car, I'm painting, I'm doing, you know, playing in the dirt. Other than that not washing my hands for anything your imagine goes like even that's right. Not even for that. Mm. And we have clients do that. And of course, you know, there are a bunch of associate therapists. It's not really just me. We all do the same thing. We've treated patients over the years. Doctors would agree. This is risky, but you know, we don't really have a higher, you know, death rate than, you know, other places and everything we do, I can kind of normal analog to. So some things I do sound really gross and disgusting, but everyone's actually doing them. If I touch a toilet, if I go to the bathroom and I don't wash my hands, and if I touch something, you don't want to touch that place that I've touched. That's that's people's first response. Now, people would say, you know, yeah, I wash my hands after I use the restroom. But a question for you, let's see if you know the answer to this. What does everyone do after they go to the bathroom, before they wash their hands. Oh, they pull up their pants. That's right. They've contaminated their pants or dress. So the odds are these contaminated hands have touched that. And once they touch that again, you know, later, because you probably don't think like, okay, don't touch my pants. You know, if you pull them up in a funny way, it's probably because you have OCD. You've recontaminated. We've done this really awful exposure conferences. I'll have people chew ABC gum. But there are mm-hmm. people listening so don't know that's already been chewed. And people are like, oh, my God, that's dangerous. That's disgusting. Doctors would say, don't do that. And I say, oh, no, this is actually reflective of a normal behavior that most people do. And, you know, I'll, I'll challenge people to try to think what it is. You know, they'll come up with things. Oh, we share food. And I say, no, no, no. Now, I'm pretty sure you would agree with me that if I spit in the plate and said, lick it, you would tell me to go somewhere. Yeah, or at least say no, thank you. <laughs> at least, yes. <laughs> However, in college, how many people did you French kiss and not know their sexual history? Mm-hmm. Or now, play drinking games and drink out of the same. Yeah, you know, I think French kissing the is, same cups is, is more intense exposure. A- absolutely, absolutely. You know? And so, you know, now I agree. French kissing, licking spit off a plate. French kissing, much more fun, but active germs with somebody I don't necessarily know. And you tell me, what do you think is more dangerous? Active germs from French kiss or 10 hour old gum that's been chewed. Hmm. So I'm doing stuff that seems awful. And again, I, I prefer French kissing to 10 hour old gum, which by the way, amazingly 10 hour old chewed gum, you kind of would think it'd get dried up. It is as wet and gooey as if you just pulled it out of your mouth. Anyway. Um, so I'm just doing stuff that people are doing without realizing it. 
You know, mm-hmm. normals basically don't know what they're doing. So, you know, a surfer listens and say, well, they all say they wouldn't do that. You know, I'm not touching the floor and putting my hand in my mouth. You got a two year old, you sit on the floor and play with them. Well, your hands touch the floor, your hands go in your mouth. College, did you go to parties and sit in the floor? Did you like not eat until you washed your hands? No. So people are, you know, normal people are always normal, are always violating their own rules. They don't know what they're doing. Mm-hmm. In OCD, the measure of severity is consistency. The more consistent you are, the more dysfunctional you are. So people say, I would never do that, but they're violating all the time. You have OCD. No, I say I don't do that. I don't do that. Hmm. But I'm trying I, to figure out at this point, did I answer your question? question or not go on yeah no no and i'll go back to the question but even people with ocd uh, unknowingly violate violate their rules absolutely because again consistency is the measure of severity so they may be way more consistent than you know somebody who's not having a problem but there's levels of dysfunction so right you know an ocd that you can find places they violate say oh yeah that doesn't bother me Now, that's Mm -hmm. important to me because that thing that doesn't bother you i'm glad because that would mean you're worse but it does also means that that can have, you know, you actually are having X happen and you're just pretending that that's okay. Mm -hmm. You know, again, get worse or get better. So the exposure is doing, doing the thing that you're scared of, say contaminating your hands and the response prevention would be not doing what you would normally do to feel clean in this situation. Maybe washing your hands, rubbing it, flicking into the air, whatever that might be. Yeah. If I have somebody who's worried about, you know, how do I know I'm not going to kill people, you know? So, you know, in my office, I always have my knife. This, you know, and I'll have them hold it over my wrist. And I tell them, don't play. It's a really sharp knife. I'm, do I know they won't cut me? I'm just really keeping my fingers crossed and really hoping they don't. Um, you know, so it's not to prove it. I'm just trying to get them used to like that, you know, okay, let's do this dangerous thing. Let's keep a knife by the bed so you can kill your spouse. Mm-hmm. And I'm going to say to them, we're going to take the risk. This could happen. I mean, yes, I'm hoping it doesn't happen, you know. Uh, You know, I I might ask, like, hey, listen, you know, I just want to know, does it seem to you like the really best thing would be to, like, you know, grab your spouse by her throat, you know, and when she's looking really scared, like start stabbing her and enjoy the fear in her eyes. You know, if they usually people go, eh, very comforting to me as therapist. You know, they say, no, that's really cool. Tell me more. Okay, that's going to modify my exposure. But if they're just kind of like not liking, I say, so maybe you will kill your spouse tonight. How will you try to cope with it? Hmm. Okay, because let's face it, how do I, you know, pretty much it means like they're going crazy. How do I know I'm not going to go crazy and not kill my wife? I, I can't prove that I won't. You know, it could be that tonight I'll slice and dice my wife. There's nothing I can do to make sure it won't happen. So what am I going to do if I ha- if it happens? Because if it happens, one of two things is true, right? I, I killed her, sliced her up. Next morning I wake up and I've come to my senses and I'm like, I am horrified. And um, the sound of a happy grandchild running through the house in the background. <laughs> um, the, um, so I wake up and I am uh, horrified. I'm going to have to call authorities. We're going to have to lock me up because I don't know what went wrong. At some point in prison or the you know mental health prison, I do kind of have to forgive myself. Not like, oh, it's okay. I killed her. But like, it wasn't me. It wasn't like my normal state. Mm-hmm. I'm still going to feel bad about it. And, but in forgiving myself, I have to try to make a decent life for myself in prison. Now, on the other hand, I may wake up the next morning and I'm still bonkers crazy. And now my first job is like, okay, I want to elude capture. And if they catch for me, I need to make a good life for myself in prison, but I won't have any guilt to deal with. What is the fear, no matter how awful it is, how would you try to cope with it? Mm-hmm. You know, sometimes we have a parent and, uh, you know, they have contamination issues. They're worried about like, oh, my God, my children will get hurt. I will often ask that parent, uh, do you love your children? Yeah. Would you do anything for them? Yeah. I'm sorry. You're a liar. How much does your OCD interfere with your children? How often do you make them do things other children don't have to do? Happen? Do you often do you make them late for things? How often do you yell at them? You know, right now you run the risk of having a 13-year-old who's going to go around telling everybody what a whack dad is, mm-hmm. or your child has a one in four chance of OCD. Do you want them to be like you? No. 
Well, they're going to do, you know, not what you say, but what you do. So you have to be a good model for them. And the thing is like, oh, but maybe they'll die from your rituals. Sorry, they might die anyway. If you have a contamination problem, unless you're keeping that kid in the house, they are going out in the world and everything you're scared of could happen to them. So your options are you do all these rituals, you don't even get the prize. So human child might die no matter what you do. The question is, would you like a healthy child or not? So in this case, exposure, even though it's scary, is an act of love. Mm -hmm. Your rituals, your fears are more important than your child. Yeah, and I, I, I'm, I, I think a lot of people you could find um, that what, what they're doing, like what their goal is, is actually going counter to what they're trying to achieve and realizing that it's actually making the problem that they're trying to potentially avoid. And it might not be the same exact problem, but making the problem that you're trying to avoid. Like, for example, I'm son, my, I'm scared that my child is going to die unless I do this. And underneath that is that I don't want anything bad to happen to my child. So by doing the OCD rituals, you're causing potentially something bad to your child. So you're causing the thing that you're trying to avoid. Yeah. Highly likely I'm causing psychological harm. And my rituals probably aren't protecting them. Mm -hmm. You know, the worst thing about being a parent is you want to protect your children. And there is only one thing that really saves our children. Luck. Most of the time they don't get kidnapped. Most of the time they don't get leukemia and die. Most of the time they don't fall this down the stairs and die. Mm -hmm. But sometimes it does happen. So you have no choice but to acknowledge, yes, that can happen. How would you try to handle it? Uh, so when people are coming to do, so it sounds like you have the exposure, but also looking at the other side of the exposure, if the worst were to happen or the thing that you want to make certain won't happen happens, how could you cope with that? So how would you try to cope? How would you try? You know, so you're, so you're you looking know, at the risk and the resource. Have two kids, you know, they said, if I have one kid, that's the end. I'd give up. It's like, really? What do you want to teach the brother or sister about that? You want their life to be ruined? Mm -hmm. If you love them, you have to cope with it. I don't want to have cancer. Yeah, I don't want to have cancer. If you get cancer and they tell you you've got two years, do you want to make the best of that two years? Or do you want to make it even worse because you're horrified that you have cancer? Huh. I mean, it's going to suck having cancer and dying, but I'd like to enjoy whatever I could. And do you want to ruin the rest of your life worrying that you have cancer so that if you get cancer in two years, you'll have lost those two years. And if you live 50 years and don't get cancer, you'll have lost them. They can only live with the risk. Hmm. Again, anything can happen. So when someone's coming to you for exposure treatment, um, they don't just come to you. You guys will go in a dumpster. Well, I mean, the COVID times things we are different, but, dumpster, but no, yeah. so sure, yeah. you, you will oh, go in yeah. a dumpster, but, but it's not that you guys just go in the dumpster for therapy and then they go back home and then they clean like this exposure they you do it together, but they're expected to also do it repeatedly over and over throughout their life and, and try and resist we the compulsion to dirty world. Yeah. It's not like we're doing treatment. Then you go back to being clean. We'll be mm -hmm. in the dirty world forever. In fact, you actually live in dirty world. The illusion that you're cleaning thing is actually false. So no matter what your cleaning rituals are, I can prove that you're actually getting as dirty as you're afraid. But we're going to do it on purpose. It is forever. Uh, you know, and, you know, people say, when can I go back to normal cleaning? You can go back to normal cleaning when you don't care about normal cleaning. Well, then I probably wouldn't do it. Right. Oh, yeah. This is, you know, an, uh, an, an excellent memoir about the uh, OCD and about what recovery, you know, what it is to have and recover it, uh, written by my good friend Shala Nicely, who's an OCD therapist with OCD, uh, is Fred in the refrigerator, you know, and it's, uh, it refers to a time she was staring in her refrigerator trying to convince herself that Fred or cat was not in it. Um, but it's lifelong. Yes. You know, you, you, you know, it is a you know, learned and a biological problem. You actually have OCD. It's something you keep working on, you know, working on it means you have lots of times of freedom. You know, it's not like having it forever means like it's going to be like this always, but it is work. Hmm. Um, and earlier you had uh, touched upon pitfalls people might get if they're not getting effective treatment for OCD. What are the most common pitfalls that you see um, you see in treatment when it, when they're not getting exposure and response prevention? I had a support group about three months ago uh, where I'd asked the group, when did they first find out that they had a problem? 
uh, when they find out, you know, what, what did they, when did they find out there was treatment for the problem? And it was just shocking. So the first major pitfall, how many people have OCD and are not diagnosed for years? You know, and it's, you know, because because there are a lot of therapists who it's not hand washing or checking life. That's not OCD, Mm -hmm. you know. Um, So so that's one nightmare. The second one is it's correctly diagnosed and the therapist feels perfectly competent, ignoring the advice of their professional organization, ignoring all the experts, you know, um, we're, we're just going to, you know, we'll talk about, it. I treat OCD. What do you do? Well, you know, they don't do anything. So person wastes years unnecessarily. Uh, then the last would be, you know, they get some form of exposure response prevention done really crappily. You know, maybe the therapist is also trying to talk them out of like, you know, we're proving you don't have this or these ridiculous, you know, a thought is just a thought. You know, this comes from acceptance and um, commitment therapy. Act really good, but I have to adapt, adapt, act for the client. I can't adapt the client to act. To say a thought is just a thought, you know, one of the ideas of act is I want to think in a non-judgmental way. And for somebody without OCD, a thought is just a thought is a very useful statement. In OCD, that's a judgmental statement. I hope it's just a thought. It's sort of killing my wife. I want to say it's just a thought so I don't have to worry about it. That becomes my ritual. Mm -hmm. So, yes, I will use ACT principles, but I'm going to adapt it to the client's problem, not pretend that I can just take the ideas of ACT and apply them without thinking about what are this client's actual symptoms. So we have all kinds of bad treatment. You know, and the very last one is, is the goal of treatment, you know, to try to live with uncertainty. You know, so, I mean, it makes, you know, the the only good thing, well, it's not a good thing. The the one thing that happened as a result of all this terrible therapy around, it makes me look incredibly good. You know, people come and they've had a problem for 20 years and they get better. And, you know, I mean, I think I'm good. But it's not really because I'm so good. It's just I'm doing the right thing. It's not my treatment. It's the accepted treatment. You know, it's not like, oh, well, they do the grace. It's just like I do the right thing. Yeah. You know, but because I'm the first guy in 20 years to see this person, it makes me look like, oh, my God. Um, And to see a change in somebody who suffered for 20 or 30 years finally feeling free. Yeah. You understand why it seems miraculous to them, you know, and yet it could have happened 30 years earlier, 20 years earlier, whatever. Um, so what therapy techniques might be useful, say for depression or other sorts of anxiety, but could actually be problematic for OCD. Any therapy technique that I'm doing properly is not a problem. Cognitive therapy. Cognitive therapy says I need to work on the cognitive distortions of the client. In what way are you know what way is their thinking wrong? That's fine. A cognitive therapist who follows that rule will not do treat OCD incorrectly. Mm-hmm. You know, if I have a cognitive therapist and I have somebody with social anxiety and they're going like, "Hey, doc." I'm afraid that if I go into a room, you know, like a crowded room, I feel like some people might not like me. Well, the cognitive therapist is not going to say, no, that's not true. You can't prove it. It's like, you know what? That's a reasonable assumption. You know, get a room with 20 people. Some people aren't going to like you. Mm-hmm. Their intolerance of uncertainty in that case. They, they want to be certain everybody likes them. It's like, oh, no, you can be certain some people don't like you. Which people? Yeah, we don't get to know. The same individual is like, I'm worried I touched this door and I might get AIDS. No, no, that can't happen. It's the same problem, but now the cognitive therapists, rather than treating intolerance and uncertainty, they are putting their values, their thoughts on the client and going, no, it's a threat estimation problem. There are threat estimation problems where I think something's more likely than it's not. But that therapist has now made a mistake. So if I'm doing the therapy techniques as they're supposed to be used with their individual lives for the client, I'm not making that mistake. Again, an act therapist. 
I incorporate lots of parts of ACT, you know, and even when we're talking, some of the things I said, you know, an ACT therapist could have said, oh, but this is that technique that's part of ACT. And it'd be like, yes, I, I would admit that ACT has a really great system. It doesn't have a great system if I take its principles and I ignore the person and I just try to overlay it on. So I'll say a thought is just a thought. Um, that's not going to be useful for OCD. Because mm-hmm. one thing you have to be worried about is a technique becoming a compulsion. That can happen. There yeah. are some people. There are some people who will try to do treatment perfectly. You know, and it's kind of an interesting problem. So what do you do if I have a client who's trying to do treatment perfectly and they're trying all the time, you know, and they'll start obsessing about it. So we have a great way to handle that. We have them do treatment wrong. Hmm. There's an app called Roundum, R-O-U-N-D-O-M. I used to use coin flipping and now I use Roundum. It's a little wheel, little pie wheel that you press the button and it spins. And you can put in two choices, 10 choices, and whatever choice comes up, is the choice we'll pick. So I will have people come. I won't have them actually ritualize, but like they come upon this thing, should I do exposure or not? Random says, do exposure or not? Might be wrong. Yep, we're gonna do that. Because again, perfect treatment is not really perfect. So we can even make treatment imperfect if that's the, if, if it's becoming a ritual to do treatment. You know, because we will have some people like, I don't know what to do now because, you know, I'm supposed to expose myself to do this, but I think I'm making it into a ritual. So now I shouldn't expose myself. So what should I do? Mm-hmm. I don't know what you should do. So we're going to use random. Maybe it's wrong, but we're going to do it anyway. And so then you expose to the idea that you, that you be might imperfect. be doing it wrong. Yeah. 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 They might yeah. be doing everything, it wrong. Everything is really, again, a probability. Mm-hmm. You know, I mean, I guess there's all or none, you know, if I, if I do shotgun to the head, you know, uh, if it, if it does blow through, I'm probably dead. I, I can't even say definitely, you know, after the fact, we can probably say it definitely. All right. So if people want to uh, learn more about you and learn more about what you're doing, how could they find or follow you? Oh, well, well let me just say the general idea first. I think, you know, finding more about OCD and where a decent treatment is, I would have them contact the International OCD Foundation, IOCDF.org, who has a yearly conference, which normally is the most amazing thing in the world because it's for sufferers and professionals and families. So you get like 1,500 to 2,000 people, two-thirds of whom are sufferers in their family. And it is a staggeringly amazing experience because there you are, a sufferer. And everyone here understands you. It's like amazing. This year, unfortunately, it's going to be an online conference, but there will be lots of good talks and things. So I would suggest going there. Um, I do have uh, my book, Freedom from Obsessive Compulsive Disorder. Uh, I think it has my entire repertoire except for about 40 minutes. So that, that would be everything that I know almost. Um, I periodically blog and post things. There's a, there's some other sites with podcasts that, you know, they're old podcasts. They can watch of mine. Um, sorry to mention this on your podcast, no, but the not, OCD not stories, uh, uh, Ralph Stewart and Stuart Ralph. I mean, it's terribly, it's two first names. Like which way is it? I think it's Stuart <laughs> Ralph. Yeah. Uh, anyway, you know, it has like two or 300 podcasts, uh, that are high quality. I'm on a bunch of them, but so are other people. Um, but you know, I think those are some good information sources for OCD. Hmm. A- any other books that you recommend? Um, which of my friends shall I get upset at me by not saying no, there, there are a bunch of other good books. Um, I like a lot of stuff with John Hirschfield. I love Shala nicely. I love her memoir. As I mentioned, it's, it's Fred in the refrigerator. I frequently recommend that because, uh, she has OCD and she talks about it in a realistic way that is she's coping really well. But I think people imagine OC therapists coping well, Oh, like she like has no problems and Shala can in a really self compassionate way talk about, yeah, you know, I still struggle, but life is great. You know, so it's a kind of realistic view, you know, and again, it's hard to accept that I want to do treatment and have no problems at all. 
I'm stuck accepting that. No, I can have a great life, but not no problems at all. Hmm. And before we sign off, if there was one main point that you think people, after listening to this whole thing, there's one main point that people should take home with them. What would be the one main point? Oh, no, I have two. And one's like a three okay. minute story. There, right, go for it. Okay. Yeah. The simple one is, if you want to be certain, there is no hope for you. That would be one main point. Okay. The other involves a client who lets me talk about her, who had came to me about four or five years ago. And she had OCD most of her life, but it was kind of at a low, it was some level that she could cope with. But four or five years ago, it slammed into her and took her down. And uh, so she came to me, she was horribly depressed and her OCD focused on over responsibility. She was a fourth grade teacher and she was worried about harming the children in every possible way. She was going to kill them with contamination. Maybe she was a pedophile. If there's anything on the floor, the children are slipping or get stabbed by it. it's her fault. The kid's shirt is, you know, not tucked in properly. So everybody's going to make fun of it. It'll be her fault. And she was really depressed. I mean, she did need to go on meds because, uh, again, it's a biological and learned problem. Meds are necessary a lot of the time. You may not want meds. Your body doesn't care what you want. So that did help her depression in that. And she worked really hard in treatment. Uh, and she had a great principal. He'd make sure she'd go in the bathroom, touch the toilets, and then spread it on the kids' desks. Um, but she was still having some problem with the responsibility. She was working really hard and doing amazing, but still kind of got there. Till one day I said to her, Brittany, you know, there's some kid in your class who's got OCD and all the stuff everyone does around contamination, they're making that kid worse. And she began to cry because she knew which kid it was. Hmm. She was going to be damned if she was going to increase his suffering. So that that really helped her propel her into, you know, working the rest of the way on her problem. This is not why I'm telling you about her. We had a group and we're talking about, you know, having OCD. And she said, I'm glad to be have my OCD under control, but I don't have any regrets that I had OCD. I have no regrets that I had to go through that suffering. Because I like who I am. I couldn't be me without it. You know, yeah, it sucked. But, you know, it's made me more empathetic. And I think it's, you know, made me a stronger person. I don't like slipping. But I think it kind of keeps me sharp. Hmm. So, yeah, I'm glad I have it under control. I'm glad I confront them. And the point is that she would say, and I agree, you have OCD. You're not defective. You have a problem that's interfering with life, but you're not defective, you, you know? And in some ways it has shaped you. And so our goal is to have you love yourself. This is part of who you were. You might've been a great person without this, but we don't know that person. So, you know, you're coming to treatment not to become better. You're already good enough. You're coming to treatment to get rid of this problem so you can have a more fulfilled life. That's what I would say. Okay. All right. Well, thank you so much for, for coming on the show. Um, a pleasure. Yeah. You know, like I said, OCD is a, to is a topic that a lot of, or a condition that a lot of people know, know of, but they might not know a ton about it. So I think we mm -hmm. covered a lot regarding different types of treatments, the core of what, what brings OCD on or what right. makes OCD worse. And then also ways to try and get, to try and get help for it. Yeah. And one thing you didn't say, how, how common is it? One in 40 people have OCD. One in 40 people. That's a lot of people. You can't buy 40 people. I guarantee you walk by a sufferer. No, absolutely. Absolutely. All right. Okay. Well, thank you for coming on the show. Thank you. Take care.